Hello everyone and welcome wherever you are tuning in from the world. Uh, we're back after a short break uh, with the first webinar in the Trailblazer series called Food and Beverage and the Future of Delivery. My name's Eloise Hansen. I'm the editor at Boutique Hotel News. We are an online B2B multimedia platform for boutique, lifestyle and luxury hotels. A few webinar guidelines before we begin. Uh, we're going to spend around 45 minutes in discussion with our trailblazers today with some time at the end to take any questions from the audience. So please, I encourage you all, if you have any questions, submit these using the Q&A function and I will try and get around to these at the end, if not during our conversation. And as a reminder, this session is being recorded and every single registrant will get a copy of that recording within 48 hours sent via email. So one of our sponsors for today's session is Aperto Guest Technologies, and they have pulled together a short introduction video, which we're going to play for you now. The only thing better than knowing you're onto something good is knowing you're onto something better. Better insights into bookings and property details. Sustainable energy management that protects your bottom line and the environment. Simplified messaging between teams and guests. Content creation tools that grow and monetize your guest experience before and after they check in. And that feeling of, I've got this. Operto Connect, your guest experience reimagined. Further details about Operto has been popped into the chat if you would like to know more. So now let's hear from our trailblazers and I'm going to hand over to each of them to introduce themselves. And I figured as we are talking about F&B today, I thought I would ask our trailblazers to also highlight what their favorite food and or drink is. Now, Bizon is our second sponsor of today's webinar. And in which case I'm going to hand over to Dominic first to introduce himself, Bizon and his favorite food or drink. Thanks, Elise. Uh, so my name is Dominic Child. I'm the VP of Sales at Bizon. Um, I've been in hospitality technology for um, pretty much all my career, about 20 years. Uh, so I've been, um, I've sold self-service uh, kiosks for hotels. I've sold uh, Sky TV <laughs> into, into hospitality. Um, spent my last eight years at the market leader in the UK, uh, fourth. Uh, for workforce management and invent inventory control. And then I joined uh, Bizon July last year. Uh, so Bizon is a restaurant management platform which incorporates, um, it's an end-to-end -end platform which incorporates from the customer's perspective, everything around digital ordering. Um, so that might be click and collect, order, order and pay, uh, room service, for example, um, web ordering. Um, all those orders feed into a, uh, a POS uh, solution, which also has inventory. And then at the back end, uh, we also have our own payment gateway. Um, so that is the end-to-end the -end solution for Bizon. We work with hotels from small independent boutiques right up to the likes of Accor Hotels. Um, my favourite food is probably Pad Thai. Uh, and I think I'm, I'm fairly uh, simple in my taste. I, I like a nice, uh, nice cold lager or, or maybe my, I think my favourite at the moment is uh, Brewdog Punk IPA. So that's my, my current tipple. Nice. And Brewdog have actually just uh, moved into the hotel space with the launch yeah. of their um, hotel in Manchester. So hopefully I'll be along to that very soon. I'm going to move from left to right on my screen here, which means I'm coming to Mark next, please. Um, hi, everyone. I'm Mark Greenaway. So I've been a chef for 27 years. Um, I started, obviously, when I was two years old. So very, very young. <laughs> um, I'm currently chef patron of Grazing by Mark Renewey, which sits within the Waldorf Astoria in Edinburgh. And then I'm opening a new restaurant called Pivot in Covent Garden in about 
two or three weeks. And about three months ago, I opened um, Greenaway's Pie and Mash, which is a small sort of modern day pie and mash concept um, and Villiers Streets, um, just down from Charing Cross. My favourite food is tacos, only because I had tacos yesterday. <laughs> um, and I'm a chef, so I love everything. And my favourite drink is coffee. Nice. I have to admit, coffee is definitely up there for me. <laughs> Thanks, Mark. No I'm, I'm coming to Robert next, please. Hi, uh, I'm Robert Thompson. I'm the founder and CEO of Andrew and Co., um, based here in New Orleans. Uh, I spent the last 10 years growing um, a, uh, a large uh, format um, entertainment concept called Punchball Social. We grew that to 120 million in sales and you know everywhere from Miami to Portland, DC to San Diego. Um, we, uh, you know, for us, it's interesting the way that we approached F and B as it relates to this uh, indoor activations or activity um, space. We uh, we endeavored to expand our F and B sales um, by attracting customers in um, to bowl and go to private karaoke rooms and arcade type activities. Um, but ultimately, it was all just part of our model to incrementally expand F and B. Um, and th that's some, uh, something similar to what we're endeavoring to uh, find success in the boutique hotel space, which is we want to use lodging uh, to emphasize the opportunities to expand those food and beverage ratio, sales ratios. Um, uh, Punchbowl, you know, was far fortunate. You know, we, we were a fast company, 50 most innovative companies in the world in 2019. Um, I, I left the company last year to found uh, Angevin so that I could get into um, the hotel space. Uh, our, first, um, uh, our first location is opening up here in New Orleans. It's called the Frenchman Hotel on iconic Frenchman Street. Um, and we've got a few other things that we were fortunate to um, win the bid on. And we were excited to perhaps announce on um, with uh, Eloise here at some <laughs> point in the future. <laughs> and your favorite food, Robert? Uh, you know, I, I'm, I'm a breakfast guy. It's my favorite meal of the day. Uh, mm -hmm. I wake up hungry. So, uh, yeah, I really like uh, a matcha tea latte and a ginger scone. Ginger scone. Interesting. <laughs> I'll have to try that at some point. <laughs> and last but not least, Ben, please. Yeah, good afternoon, everybody. My name is Ben Purton. I'm the owner and executive chef uh, for my uh, catering company called Time and Place, which is really just bringing in kind of everything I've done over my, uh, my, my career kind of into one, into one place as it were. So I, I must have started cooking the same time as Mark. So I'm also only about 23 years old, 24 years old, because that's the amount of time I've been, I've been in kitchens. Um, and I, I never really wanted to be a chef. I always wanted to be a policeman. That didn't quite work out. And I fell, in, I fell into this amazing industry and have built my way up ever since, uh, cooking in some of the the best, in my opinion, uh, hotels, restaurants uh, in London. And I've also stepped out and done a little bit in, in uh, retail. So I, I ran Selfridges, the department store, for about three years in central London. And I was also the executive chef for Goldman Sachs, um, comprising of about four or five different different blocks around sort of Fleet Street and St Paul's area for a couple of years. Um, I then jumped into recruitment in my last, my last sort of full-time role, just because it's something I'd never, never really done before. And then time of time and place really come alive in lockdown because so many of my clients were saying, can we have something sent to us? Can we have, can we, we, we used to come sort of once a month for your afternoon teas. So we started a bit of a, a local kind of delivery service uh, that I was also then helping other hotels and restaurants um, sort of work into that. Uh, and I'll be focusing on time and place full time from October after coming back from Paris, where I'm going to be judge for Well Young Chef of the Year. Uh, my favourite food, and again with Mark, we have a lot in common. Uh, I cooked this at the weekend for a private party, and it was roasted rack and slow braised shoulder of lamb. Um, that, that goes with many, many things, but those two bits would almost be my favourite go-to. And at the end of the meal, just before the end of the night, I love nothing more than a really nice ice cold glass of amaretto. Very nice. You will have very great taste, I have to admit. So thank you all for the introductions. And before we move on to the main conversation, I always like to highlight some context. And these are mainly headlines that I have published on Boutique Hotel News. And I'm going to focus here 
on the uh, two articles that are on the right hand side. So Sextant Stays, which is a property operator in the US, has partnered with Second Kitchen, which is a, a virtual kitchen service, specifically just for room service. And in this instance, Sextant Stays or the hotel can curate a menu based on the menus of local restaurants. Orders are then prepared within virtual kitchens at these restaurants and then delivered to your hotel and your room. Operating under a slightly different model, Graduate Hotels partnership with C3, which is a food tech platform, will see C3 assume the daily operations of all on-premise food services. So what this effectively means is that the hotel's kitchen becomes a multi-brand digital kitchen offering um, food brands that are within the C3 portfolio. And customers here can either choose to dine in or have a delivery or takeaway service. Now on the next slide, another pivot which I've seen over the last year is pop-up experiences. And these can range from pop-up dining experiences, pop-up kitchens, pop-up farmers markets, and Guest House, which is a new UK hotel brand, has introduced a tipple truck which is basically a pop-up drinks station that will be visiting various food festivals across the country this month. And on the last and final slide, we do have Angevin and Co's uh, partner with Lark Hotels um, in the States, but I want to focus on the middle story here because this story is based on an event that we at Boutique Hotel News held at a hotel in London last year. And this particular event was an open discussion format in response to a central motion. And that motion was that hoteliers should outsource their F&B operation to a third party specialist. And I just want to highlight some key takeaways from that event. Number one, Hoteliers that independently develop F&B are ill-fated from conception. There is too much focus on keeping capex low and therefore there's no real commitment to making it a success. Takeaway number two. Hotels have evolved from inns, hence the passion for F&B is inherent. This passion has become prevalent since 2008 as hoteliers are now more in tune with F&B trends. Takeaway number three, disruptors like Uber Eats and Deliveroo are changing the nature of F&B, but how can risks be mitigated? When outsourcing a product or service, a strategy for handling mistakes needs smoothing. So this is all just context um, for our um, upcoming conversation, and we look forward to hosting uh, more events like to F&B or not to F&B in the future. But now let's talk about F&B and the future of delivery. And I'd like to begin with a question to Mark, please. And I'd like to know, Mark, how did you adapt your operations and pivot during the pandemic? Um, I mean, I love how you're using the word pivot. Um, <laughs> That's the name of my, my upcoming restaurant. So obviously my restaurant is based in Edinburgh during lockdown. As it's in, sits inside the world of Astoria, there was a little bit of red tape to get through and, and, and everything else before we could start doing cook at home boxes, mm -hmm. which was something that I, I was really keen to do on a number of, for a number of reasons. I mean, you know, you've got to keep the sort of staff busy um, during lockdown, they can't just sit at home, you know, all the time, but it was more to keep the brand alive, to keep, you know, as much as, you know, I love it or hate it, my, my name has become a brand and we've worked incredibly hard at building that brand through, you know, several different mediums. Um, and it was just, how do we stay relevant coming out of lockdown um, as relevant or even more so before we went into it? And one of the things that we've seen on the massive upsurge was, was restaurants doing cook at home boxes. But we, we wanted to do cook at home boxes, you know, that, that was, re, you know, relative of the food that we were doing at the time. It reflected the skills that we had in the kitchen that people couldn't normally replicate at home. And taking dishes to, 
such a, an extent where it was just either finishing the cooking process and plating it up, um, or we gave them such clear instructions that they really couldn't fail at it. And it was something that, you know, took a huge amount of work to pull off. It's not, let's just write a three course menu and hope someone buys it. It's the marketing, the PR, the boxes, how it's put together, the labeling system that you use, the traceability you have for every single ingredient that you use, you know, training the staff that, you know, you have to weigh every single pot of, you know, green beans or chicken breast or whatever, whatever it's going to be, cured halibut or mayonnaise or, and then it's finding things or containers that were relevant sort of to us and our brand and our values. So everything had to be recyclable. There was no plastic used. Um, so it was a huge amount of work, but it was something that we considered keeping after lockdown. Um, and it will be something that we bring back for special occasions. So we're now talking about doing a Christmas one. We'll probably do a Valentine's Day one. We'll probably do a Mother's Day one. We might even do a barbecue one for Father's Day. Or So I think it's really given us a whole lot of new skills that we never knew we had. Mm -hmm. But as chefs and restaurateurs, we obviously did have. Um, and it's just, I think we've sort of just tapped into a market there that that's great for us. It is a huge amount of work, but it does just give you, again, something to talk about, something to promote. You know, you can't just keep saying, come to my restaurant, we're great. You know, not, not everyone believes that. So it's just giving yourself just something else to talk about or another edge or another avenue, I suppose. Mm -hmm. So do you see then these like boxes, uh, takeaway products as becoming a very much permanent feature of operations to a certain extent yes i think it will be here to stay because people will have gotten used to that now um mm. i mean i honestly can't tell you the last time i went to a supermarket i now just do it online mm. and i think food is sort of heading in the same sort of way but not to the extent that we did see it during lockdown mm -hmm. because during lockdown at some stage every restaurant in the country was was doing cook at home boxes. Um, so I think it will be here to stay, but on select occasions, as I've said, maybe one at Christmas, maybe one at Valentine's Day. I don't know if restaurant kitchens can sustain it full time when they're dealing with a full restaurant. Mm -hmm. And that's where cloud kitchens, dark kitchens, ghost kitchens, you know, whatever you call them, really sort of come into play um, either full time or part-time for certain certain occasions mm -hmm. as my belief anyway mm -hmm. but I could be wrong <laughs> and I'd like to pick you up here Mark on the actual the, the, the dining aspect of your restaurant what does the remainder of the year look like in terms of bookings I've heard there's great demand at the moment for people just, just wanting to get out and eat and have that on-site experience yeah so we so we so at grazing we're currently only open Thursday night Friday night Saturday night and Sunday lunch Mm -hmm. So that's a sort of deliberate tactic. When we went into lockdown, we had 14 chefs. We were open seven days a week. Yeah. But immediately four chefs went home. So mm -hmm. two went back to Italy, one went to New Zealand, one went to Australia. So when it came to reopening, we thought, okay, we don't really want to go back to 14 chefs seven days a week. Um, what days can we open that we know will be, you know, um, mm -hmm. fruitful for us? And so far, we're fully booked every single night and every Sunday for lunch. Which So we're in a really sort of lucky position. We probably will extend those opening hours throughout December, mm -hmm. but then look to pull it back January again because there is a massive mm -hmm. supply chain issue, staffing mm -hmm. issue, um, and there's no point opening up on a, a rainy Tuesday night in November if we're only going to be doing 20, 30 covers and 150 cover restaurant. Um, mm -hmm. I mean, that's not to say that would happen, but at the moment we're fully booked. So we would like to sort of focus on, on that before we start stretching the team mm -hmm. or looking to re-employ when we know we probably won't be. Mm -hmm. Thanks, Mark. And Ben, I'd like to come to you next, please, and ask whether you think that the pandemic has forced a 
permanent change in the way that hotels deliver food and beverage? Yeah, and I think I think the pandemic has changed so many things, um, and that that definitely being one of them. Because I think I think for for a long period of time, the same kind of stuff has been done in the same way, um, in various different guises, depending on your on your your brand, your location, and the pandemic has has changed that. And, it, and it's I think initially has changed it from a a safety point of view. So as an example, we we always used to keep. Uh, I've been in hotels since I was about 16. So we, we, it's always been the safety element and the training element and the, and the things that we do that we know are going to keep everyone happy and safe are kind of done behind closed doors. No one wants to see that. Um, you've got to get cleaners in. You've got to get the sanitizing done when no one else can see it. And I think that will now be at the forefront and people want to see those kind of things. Um, I think um, although it's a real detriment to, to revenues coming in, um, quite a lot of diners that, that we speak to like the slightly more spaced out environments um they like the fact that they probably only get one 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 waiter or one waitress coming to the table during their their time so there's elements that that are throwing up um uh, interesting interesting ways of moving forward but also interesting challenges because lots of these com things come with a come with a cost and i think the hotel world in the past have been very quick sometimes to just pass on if we, if we get an, if we get a, a, an upgrade in costs let's just let's just pass that on because the world is good life is good and people are just going to keep coming back um and i think anything that's uh, and i think it will come back eventually but again it all goes back to sort of trust and safety from a guest point of view but the the kind of the buffet element where everyone can go up and, and help themselves we've already seen them uh, well, they, I think they, they almost died out in, in their entirety initially, and then, and then they slowly started coming back in, smaller portions, um, service team members behind the buffets kind of serving things for you, so more of, a, more of an element, and I think those things will carry on. Um, people liking the fact of having in-room dining, whereas I think from a hotelier's point of view in the past, it's, it's, it's very much been, if we can get them downstairs to the restaurant, um, get them downstairs for breakfast that would be very very helpful again from our from our own productivity and cost point of view um, many guests now are saying I, I want to come but I want to spend a lot more time in my room so how, do, how does the room element um, focus for that and I just think um, the staffing issue I mean Mark, Mark touched on it um, a little bit in, in his piece and the staffing challenges that, that everyone's got um, and if you haven't got them, congratulations, because you're, you're, in the, you're definitely in the major, in the minority rather than the majority at the moment. And things are having to change because of that, because trying to run a 24-hour, seven-day-a-week operation with 50% of your staff in, at some point, you have to, you have to, something has to give. And either your brand, your quality, the guest experience, something somewhere has to give, or you reduce down in certain areas where where you can um, slightly easier in a, rest, you know, a pure restaurant environment because when a hotel is open, it, it's open type thing. But I think all those all those individual elements all come together for a very different experience. Um, mm. uh, and I think I think they're here they're here to stay long term. And the people that can adapt to that um, can make the margins work, can make the sort of the, the day to day um elements of that work and still put the guest at the heart of everything they do rather than the guest can sometimes feel in these situations like a little bit of a of a nuisance like, oh no another one's turned up that means we've got to go and sanitize again that means we've got to go and clean again that means we have to refill the, the, the buffet elements remembering that if they didn't come you have a bigger problem than if than if than if they came type thing and put in every every single thing that we do in that perspective what can we do to enhance the guest experience mm. to make them feel safe, to make them feel really welcome? Because that will inevitably again uh, generate them returning and and listen to what they have to say. We are very, very good at hoteliers at saying, this is what the guests want. So I gave it to them. I don't understand what the problem is because it's not quite working. Um, listen to them, ask them, find out, do, do, your, do your research, um, use all the resources that are available to that. And 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 then when you find out what that is, do the do as much as you can to make those those kind of things happen. Mm -hmm. Thanks, Ben. And I'd like to bring Dominic in um, on this point because Ben was just touching on how the guest experience needs enhancing. And I'm I'm wondering, Dominic, from 
the tech point of view, how can technology reshape that guest experience? Dominic, you're on mute. Classic, thank you. <laughs> um, yeah, so I, th I think with any of these, uh, could I, I think you always have to start with the guest experience. Um, I think if you just looking at hotels is is a is a bit kind of insular, and I think if you looked at, I mean, my my kind of previous experience, um, you look at hotels with things like pay per view TV, which you know if you go back forty years and you went to a hotel and it had pay per view, it was wow, this is a great guest experience. I can put on my favourite film. Um, in you know now is 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 died out because people bring their own entertainment with them um probably you know 10 20 years ago satellite tv was coming in and then it was about having the tv in in, in the bar area to get people out of the rooms to watch the football or you know that kind of uh, that kind of experience so and then and then kind of talking about f and b now the 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 guest experience uh, you know you always have to look at what they have at home so with tv there was that period of going from four channels uh in a in a in the home environment to four channels plus pay tv then when everyone had you know sky at home and 300 channels and then they go to a hotel and they have 10 or 15 channels it's a disappointment even at kind of top end hotels wouldn't go to you know more than 20 channels um and then particularly you know for international travel as well you might have you know one spanish channel one american channel what you know so it's very very limited and you end up just watching the news um, when it comes to F and B, in exactly the same way, you have, you know, you've now got the home environment where you can order, uh, you know, home kits from top restaurants. You can order your favourite, you know, quick service from McDonald's, whatever, or you know, KFC on on any any mobile phone app. So, so when you then come to a hotel and you haven't got that means of ordering, and you might, you know, that you might not be set up for room service or um, a lot of it is, you know, dependent on on the type of hotel, whether you're city centre or rural. But there's, in terms of the guest experience, there's there's that challenge for the hotelier to think, you know, what what do I want to give my guests? Do I want to give them um, a a you know great fine dining experience um, because we're a five star hotel, or do you think actually, you know, you've got an asset that that you want to sweat, and you might kind of look at home delivery kits, and you might turn into a dark kitchen in your quieter hours, those kind of things. So I think from the customer's perspective, you think, you know, what do they have at home and what are the trends? Um, and then kind of work that into, you know, the, the financials of, of running a hotel and, and things like staffing are obviously, you know, uh, very key. Um, but the, the trend of, and this isn't, a, it's been accelerated by, by COVID, but if you look at the trend of delivery over the last five years, in both the U in Europe and the US, the, tr the trend of uh, people who have be been using delivery apps, for example, has, has doubled in, in both the US and, and Europe in the last five years. And the forecast is for, for that to carry on growing. And that was a linear growth, not, not just, uh, you know, not just 2020 when people are stuck at home. Um, and then I think the experiential thing of home delivery kits where, you know, people like me kind of sat at home the you know the for me to go out to a restaurant or you know hotel restaurant in the evenings compared to actually if i want a, a treat and experience i might um i might engage a you know a top restaurant to send me a home delivery pack and then I, it's a new experience so i think it, you know the hotels can think can we extend our experience outside of you know the, the bricks and mortar um and then obviously that brings in you know the the means to manage that and and technology is obviously absolutely core to to making that seamless and work. Mm -hmm. and mm. What about from an operator's point of view in terms of uh, the data that they might be able to collate from implementing or deploying certain technologies? I mean, can data help deliver value? Yeah, uh, <coughs> absolutely. Um, I mean, I think data is key. And you think if you go back to what is the status quo, you know, the status quo is paper menus. Um, and, and, and when you say to a restaurant, how do you, how do you sell 
often the uh, you know is is based on unlocking the front door and opening the doors up. Um, so how you know in terms of promotion and how how you sell, if there's a way of understanding who your customer are you know customer is. Um, and there's lots of all, all the platforms that we talk, you know, everyone knows in terms of delivery platforms, they're very good at collecting your customer data. Um, but do you know it? No, you haven't got it. So um, so that's a challenge for, 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 you know, for restaurants to understand exactly who their customer is. And once they're in, it's it's um, understanding, you know, what they like, how the menu is working. So. For example, um, you know, with, with Bizon, there's the ability to understand uh, the interaction with the digital menu. So what that means is who's looking at what dishes, uh, conversion rates of those dishes, um, who who puts dishes in a, in, a, in the kind of you know the the shopping basket, if you like, and then and who takes it out. You can play around with the order of uh, you know menu placement and menu wording. So to make things more appealing if they're not selling. Um, so it just, it's another level of data that you never get from a, from a paper menu. Mm -hmm. um, so I think that's the digital transformation that, that businesses are now looking at. Um, and then in terms of historical sales data, you know, it's understanding um, what people had when they previously dined with you. And, and, you know, if you want to really delight guests, you could understand and whether this is because they had room service before the next time they stay, you could put their favorite bottle of wine in their room or, you know, nice things like that, which you just need historical data from. So, mm. yeah, it's really important to, to not give up your data to to the delivery platforms um, and also understand data for, from your uh, your regular guests. Thanks, Tom. Mm. And I'd like to move on to Robert, please, because I the fact that you championed this entertainment concept predominantly within a, a restaurant four walls, you must have spied an opportunity to have moved into the hotel space. And I want to pick your brain, Robert, to understand what did prompt that decision to move into hotels and where is that opportunity? Yeah. It, you know, I, I've been um, enamored of um, boutique hotel and specifically finding ways to develop experiential boutique hotels for a decade. Um, and this felt like the right um, the right opportunity, <laughs> um, given sort of the global macro uh, conditions. It, it was a great time to pivot into it. But, you know, uh, and, and this is I always have to say this with with all due respect to an extraordinarily successful hotel industry and a vibrant boutique hotel um, a subset of, of the broader hospitality industry, that there are extraordinary restaurants inside of hotels. And the folks on, uh, some of the folks on this call are executing those um, uh, already. But what, what, what I determined uh, consistently, but not exclusively is that um, you know, hotels uh, uh, had lost this emphasis over the decades of treating the F and B really as sort of the, um, the the guiding light opportunity. There, you know, if you go back, you know, a thousand years, you think about what a hotel was, and it was a tavern. It was a place to go and eat and drink. It wasn't just a place to rest your head. Um, it needed to be a, th a three hundred sixty degree experience. So, the the you know, so if you look at it economically. Um, we know that if you can incrementally add to those F and B sales, if say you're running 75% lodging and 25% F and B, if you can expand that F and B without sacrificing any of the lodging to 50%, obviously that that all adds to the top line and pushes to the bottom. You know, the way to 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 get there um, was exciting for me because we've always been a design forward um, brand, and so when we can create. Um, these hotel, ex these restaurant experiences inside of hotels using um, layouts that um, that aren't consistently used in the hotel space where the restaurant is really the star. Um, uh, you know, we, we look at it through a lens of where we're actually designing a restaurant that happens to have 75 to 100 rooms of, of lodging on top. Right. And so when you when you when you make that subtle change in, in how you're viewing it, it does. Um, modify how you construct, design, and bring to life the uh, both the restaurant and the hotels. So, it, it uh, you know because we also believe that you're not going to simply 
expand those F and B sales through the, through the lodging guests. Um, we believe that you have to think about this again, like a restaurant tour first, which is um, how do we engage with the local community? And you, you're going to need to position your restaurant in the appropriate location within the larger box uh, of the hotel operation so that it's convenient and obvious um, for the, the outside uh, guest. Um, you know, but, but really it also goes beyond just thinking about, you know, where to, how to design and, and, and um, locate your restaurant within the box. We, you know, there are other um, sort of comprehensive thought processes that we go through. For example, we're opening up a, um, we're going to open up a hotel um, in early 2023 um, that also has um, a flower shop component to it. And so we're designing the flower shop and the hotel really to be the same concept. There will be this relationship between how we convey and market flowers to the locals and to actually the traveling guests. You know, we will sell flowers to go off of the food menu and off of the beverage menu, et cetera. And then the sort of the, the flora and the aroma of the flowers as you walk into a hotel, that's, that, that's an experience, right? That's, that falls into the experiential definition. Um, so, we're, you know, we're just trying to, um, to, to help the consumer see that there's, a, that there's slightly a different approach here. And, you know, fortunately, there's none of the, our, our friends that are giant institutional hotel flags uh, on this call and maybe not even listening to us because uh, they got their own agendas. Um, but uh, we're, we're really trying to be the opposite of, uh, of what those institutions had um, morphed hotels into over the last 50 years. Mm -hmm. I'm curious to hear your thoughts, Robert, as to see as to how you think the physical product of a restaurant within a hotel is therefore going to um, evolve. I mean, what's your vision? You mentioned that the restaurant is going to be like the, almost like the beating heart of, of, the, of the hotel. So does that mean simply the location of the restaurant within the four walls of the hotel? I mean, just out of, um, just anecdotally, I used to work in hotels and I, would, I, we used to have a lot of guests who would come in, in-house guests, and they wouldn't know that the restaurant is open to the public. And I didn't know if that was just a, a misconception from the public that these organizations, these businesses were actually open for anyone to book in. Um, but please, let's go back to the question, Robert. How do you see restaurants evolving within hotels? Yeah, it's gotta be with positioning. It's gotta be within, you know, with, with your ingress um, uh, positioning both for uh, outside the hotel and, and within the hotel, it, it speaks to how you market it. Um, we know that millennials and Gen Z, which, which um, it, it are our focus, not because we think that's our only hotel guest, but because we know specifically millennials are the most influential um, cohort, we, you know, consuming cohort we've ever seen. And uh, when we focus on those, we get everybody else. <laughs> right, so we get Gen, we get Gen X, we get Gen Z, and, we, and to a degree, we get Boomers. Um, and uh, so, when when you market to them, and we know that they like to be marketed to, in um, you know, in their social feeds, in a way that feels native to uh, to what's already in their feed, it, it's it, it's not as simple as just you know telling your architect to make sure he gets the front door in the right place. Right, mm -hmm. it, it 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 it's an it's a it's a complicated soup. Um, you know, and if we can get all the ingredients right, it, it'll, it'll taste right and, and people will come back for more. Thanks, Robert. And I'd like to move on to bring Mark back into the conversation here to talk about F&B trends. And I'm going to um, merge my next question with one that's come from the audience here, because yep. I'd like... I'm, I understand that the nature of trends, really, they, they, they die out eventually, yeah. right? They're not here forever. And I know Pivot that's about to launch in, um, in Covent Garden, you're changing the menu once a month. You are literally pivoting that menu, um, be it in line with the season, so that you make sure that everything is on point. So how do you retain a competitive yeah. edge within F&B when that life cycle of an F&B trend, which I believe I've heard is placed between four to six years? Um, 
I mean, for me, I mean, the whole concept came about and the whole name came about due to the pandemic. I mean, everybody, all I kept hearing was how when FB comes out of this, we're going to have to pivot their offering, they're going to have to change. You know, they can't, we can't, restaurants won't be the same as they were before, customers won't be the same as they were before. And then when I was looking at the space with my business partner, I realised how sort of intimate, it's only 30 covers. You know, there really isn't the kitchen space for a la carte menus, tasting menus, lunch menus, set course menus. So I thought, well, how do we do it that makes, or, you know, the customers want to come back every month. Why not just reinvent the menu, the wine list, the cocktail list every single month? And it means that we won't be following trends. We'll be sort of, you know, using my 27 years of experience and cooking techniques, flavor profiles, and suppliers to hopefully create our own sort of sense of style. Um, you know, we're looking to do food that is instantly recognizable. You know, we're not going to be using posh words on menus like sous vide and, and you know, people don't really know what these words mean so that we don't really need to use them. They just need to know that it's going to be an amazing plate of food. So mm -hmm. I think trends, you know, if you are following trends, you have to be careful that that you're not jumping on the back of the end of one um, or you're not too forward in front of one because one might not catch on and one's already dying out. So I, I think you just need to be careful when looking at trends that you're positioned correctly or you just sort of do your own thing. Um, and, and hopefully we're just going to be doing our own thing. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, can I can I add to that with what's it? I, I agree with, you know, uh, with Mark was saying there and it's like, it's really critical that you um, you know, that, that a menu as it relates to trend, um, it, one can only engage in that if it's coherent with your broader concept, right? So there are some trends yeah. that don't make sense for all of us, right? And so you have to have a coherence because especially today's consumer is so savvy um, and so intuitive in that way, they'll identify an inauthentic, um, you know, trend that you're trying to utilize. But menus are, are living organisms and they evolve and they should but they have to evolve in a, co a coherent manner. You know, if, um, you know, if there's a fascination with rhinos on, on this planet, it's not like we're going to go out and get surgeries to convert ourselves into, you know, gigantic stumpy rhinoceros. Yeah. <laughs> it's like, it's, it just, it just has to make sense. Sorry, that was a bit tortured, but I think you get my point. <laughs> no, and I think that's true of anything that any brand <laughs> does, whether they are in, F and B or not, is they have to be true to their own brands rather than trying to mold their brand into someone else's just to follow a trend or jump in the back of something or, yeah. And your and customer think, appreciates I that. Add, I think to add, to add to that as well is that if you tried, as I, and hoteliers tend to do it a lot more than individual restaurants because individual, individual restaurants quite often have a specific brand that the way that they're going and hoteliers tend to be the um, let's try and make sure we've got a bit of what everyone may want, in which case you might follow five to 10 to 15 trends at one time. And the brigade that you have, um, I think I think Mark mentioned it right at the beginning, you've got to be able to, the, the, it's got to be on brand, of course, with the message of, of who you work for and, and the way they're going. But you've also got to look at who's producing that. And when I go into hotels, I look at a restaurant and I think, wow, you must have a sushi chef someone who's amazing at, um, at Chinese <laughs> and, Asian, and Asian fusion cooking. You must have an Indian on site somewhere because this is all authentic stuff. I mean, and all of a sudden you go into the kitchen and there's three or four guys that have just really picked up the, the basics of making things happen. So I think you've got to be really careful about following every single trend um, going and picking the ones that really mean something to, to you, your brand, and ultimately your guests. Otherwise you have... Um, a huge amount of stuff that's on your menus or within your within your hotel that you've bought that you you, you might sell one or two a month of, in which case it, be, it becomes less of a trend in a, in a very short period of time. I was uh, reading an article not too long ago, um, which I guess is the definition of what a trailblazer is. But if you're looking to keep in line with trends, the best bet is to just make your own. Yeah. <laughs> set the benchmark high and make your own. And uh, a question that's come in from uh, Katrina Craig, um, looking at healthy eating and wellness, which perhaps was once 
perceived as a trend, but maybe unlikely to go away. And Mark, as you um, pivoted to that, uh, meals in boxes and, and sending them as, as a takeaway service, do you see the demand for takeaway cook at home boxes focused on healthy eating? Um, I mean, I think definitely yes, but I think there'll be brands that do that exceptionally well and there'll be brands that do it not so well. Um, I mean, it's not, you know, my food isn't geared towards that. My food's more, you know, if it's not got butter in it, there's something wrong. It's very indulgent. It's, it's, it's things that you really shouldn't be able to make at home. Um, but there is brands out there that, that will focus on that. And I think there's a huge market for it, definitely. It's just not what I do. Thanks, Mark. So let's move on then to talk about, I want to bring Dominic up on the staffing um, issue. I mean, it's, it's, it is a, a really big issue that is facing hospitality and it's not just um, down to country, um, it's pretty much global at the moment. And I'd like to know, Dominic, how might digital ordering services support businesses that are struggling to recruit? Yeah, I mean, it's, um, I, I, for as long as I can remember, selling technology into hospitality, there's, uh, there's a general resistance against it because um, it's always assumed that technology is going to get rid of you know, the human touch, whatever that is. Um, and, um, and obviously there's different levels depending on you know, the type of hotel, whether it's budget or, or high end. Um, but I think now there's, uh, you know, th there's like this perfect storm of lack of availability with with high demand and and, and everyone, I think there was uh, a stat out recently, which is 80 percent of all hospitality businesses are short of front of house staff. Uh, I know that extends to kitchens as well. So um, it is it, it's universal. It's particularly felt, you know, within the UK after Brexit as well. Um, so yeah, it's a real challenge, and I think now that that challenge, you know, some operators are dealing with it in different ways. So some are just deciding not to open, or um, you know, open on close on Monday and Tuesday lunch times, for example, just to give their staff some a, a break rather than working them, you know, kind of sixty, seventy hour weeks, uh, which just isn't ideal. And I think uh, the more forward thinking operators are thinking. How, how can I really embrace technology to, and, and this shouldn't be a thing of, you know, laying staff off because, you know, it's, which technology is often seen as, you know, replacing humans. Um, I think, you know, for Bizon, we, we take, we take the, the guest experience part uh, as, as key. Um, and, you know, we have a, a, an order and pay element to our solution where most, most order and pay solutions do exactly that it's you you order you pay you order you pay you order you pay so you end up um you know if you go for a three course meal and a couple of drinks you might have to pay five times which we think is a rubbish guest experience uh so bizon has the ability to have an open tab which you think it's not it's not you know rocket science but that's the status quo when you go to a restaurant it's not unusual just to sit down at a table order your food and drink and pay once at the end. So our, our digital ordering enables customers to do exactly that, which, um, and, but also um, you can embrace that kind of uh, ordering, you know, via a waiter when you want to, as well as using your own mobile phone, for example. So uh, you can get the best of both worlds. And, and that technology enables operators to effectively, you know, reduce the number of uh, or the amount of labor by 50% because if the front of house staff aren't taking orders and aren't taking payments you're basically taking away the admin and a lot of the time people say well you know i i, I don't want that because i want i want the human touch I, you know but actually you know if you really think about it when was the last time you went to a restaurant and thought do you know what the way that waiter took my order or the way they took my payment was just spot on you don't, you know, what you do like is the conversation with the waiter or, you know, talking to them about the wine list or where's the steak from um, and, and freeing the front of house staff up from, uh, you know, from those admin tasks means that you can give, you can actually give much better levels of 
uh, service. Mm. So, so I think you know. So now for, for us, I think you know, technology is a real enabler. Uh, that at the point when you know everyone is short of front of house staff, there's got to be a way. You know, because everyone is short of front of house staff, paying them a bit more is not going to work. Doing better training is not going to work. It's not going to fill that gap across the, the entire industry. Um, yes, you know, people at the top, everyone will want to work at, you know, Galvin's or, uh, you know, uh, Gordon Ramsay or whoever it might be. Um, but, you know, the, the kind of the bulk of the middle market is like, how do you fill those jobs and how do you how do you have really good guest, guest satisfaction in that middle market? Mm -hmm. And we see it as, you know, having technology, not everyone's going to use it, but, you know, we've there's some interesting stats that, Kind of laments the uh, the the old age uh, generation who uh, go to you know the traditionals who go to a restaurant and always want face to face service. Actually, there was a survey saying only one in five of them uh, prefer order and pay solutions. And I was thinking, actually, you know, one in five, twenty percent for that generation is pretty strong. And then you actually look at you know the kind of uh, the 45 below and using the phone just edged was just preferred over face to face mm -hmm. so i think hospitality needs to take a bit of a kind of an honest look and, and an evaluation to think look we, we this short starving thing isn't going away training's not going to fix it paying them more isn't going to fix it actually if you embrace technology as well as having the you know the human touch for those people who really want it and uh and have the right platform to support that, you can really improve. Uh, not only can you save, you know, save on labour costs, answer the, uh, the the recruitment problem, but also give better customer service. Would you agree mm. then, Dominic, that um, adopting technology in certain instances can actually enhance? say KPIs like spend per guest and I know you refer to your open tab capability I mean how does that improve maybe the profitability of a restaurant yeah I, I mean it's it's if you think if you reference Amazon so the the great thing about Amazon is it's so easy to order um, you know everyone does it now you pick up your phone you swipe you swipe right and it's like buy now swipe you've got you've got it in the next day um customers expect that kind of ability you know wherever they are i'll go back to what i was saying at the start with you know the at home experience and, and not wanting less you know that generally they want more when they stay in a hotel so um i think i, th I think that is really important in terms of spend per head the open tab uh, ability we think is an enabler for selling more you know if you're wavering over do you buy a second drink or or, or not and you have to flag down a waiter uh, or you have to put in your pin that you know your credit card details a second time it's it's another barrier to making that purchase if you just open you know you've got the web page on your phone and you just say one more beer order and it it turns up on your table that's great um, and if it's in the power of the customer, they, you know, they will buy if they want to. So we see uh, of business customers, we see average order values uh, of people ordering with their phone is 38% higher than customers who order face to face. Mm. So, so it really does, you know, encourage spend. Um, and then also, you know, that, that the ease of purchase when it comes to something like room service, or you know, if you're if you're by the by the pool or in the spa or any of any of those kind of scenarios, um, you're not going to have lots of front of house staff running around those areas. But actually, the, the guest really might want to drink. Um, so if they if they've got their phone and a, a QR code to scan, and they can simply place an order, and and the, the code tells you know the 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 hotel where that customer's located, um, then it's you get you're just going to sell more. So yeah, I think it's uh, I think it's really important and something that that hotels can really uh, really make use of. Thanks, Dominic. I have um, a couple of questions that I would like to ask before we um, close off today, and I'd like to come to Robert and then Ben. So Robert, 
I'd like to ask you, what has been your key takeaways from establishing a food brand? I know earlier we were touching on, on trends and how you should really <laughs> maybe try and pioneer your own, but what's been your key learnings from your experience? Yeah, I, I think it's always critical to understand who your target consumer is. Um, and one has to be um, um, realistic and honest with themselves with the trade area that uh, within where they're operating. Um, you know, I think as you uh, try to bring them to life, the optics, the physical environment are, are, are key. Again, I'll go back to this word coherence uh, to maintain coherence between the culinary platform, the beverage platform and the physical in the physical space itself. But critically, uh, more and more today, uh, you know, you have to know how to develop the digital environment for that space. You have to know how you have to treat the digital space because most consumers will make a decision about whether to come into your establishment um, through their digital experience before they come in for the physical. So, mm -hmm. you know, we see we see trial, we see consumer trial through, um, you know, that, that can be spurred by either um, um, successful PR uh, or, or digital uh, environment that is enticing to them. And then the second, you know, uh, channel is that uh, if you, uh, if you do a good job and the guest wants to, wants to return and then they tell their friends, but uh, ironically now they just tell their friends in a digital environment, right? Nobody, you know, nobody ever tells anybody on the phone. I had a nice dinner. They have to say, well, if you want to hear about it, just go read my review. I left it. I left mm -hmm. it online somewhere, but, uh, but it, you know, it's important for that. And, um, uh, you know, and, and for us, we, we will focus, uh, there has to be this connection between the hotel brand and the F&B brand, but there has to be, again, this connection between the local trade area and how we're going to find success for, um, um, you know, with the local community. Mm -hmm. what, what, whilst I have you, Robert, I'm actually going to um, send this question over to you from Ben Potter, and I think I'll ask the same question to Ben as well. Um, that do you think that while commercially a hotel may be better off operating with things such as a dark kitchen, they trade off brand authenticity by not providing guests with meals cooked within the hotels? Or do you think that guests don't care much about where their meal comes from? I don't think meals can be successfully delivered unless they're really coming from about 25 yards away. Um, we all know that there's, there's declining quality um, uh, for, for a food product as it delivers. And we're all getting smarter about what the delivery vessels are and the to-go containers. And we understand how to, we, we think uh, better about how to create travel sturdy food, but, but nothing compares to, you know, you can ask the chefs on this call, right? I, I suspect they'll back me up here. Nothing compares to it coming out of a hot kitchen and going down straight in front of a guest. And look, I, I just think that, um, I'm uh, I, I'm either old fashioned or I'm just not quite bright enough. But the uh, I I I I am not enamored. I do not believe that there is this permanent um, negative impact to the to the physical restaurant space associated with the delivery platforms. A, a week before COVID, I was you know I was um, uh, I had some bad timing to do a podcast where I talked about how delivery was overrated. I created this product called Punchable Social, which is experience, and you can't deliver bowling and private karaoke along with food through Grubhub, right? You have to come to the physical environment to do it. And, and I think that that's what people want. Um, it, 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 it is not a zero-sum game, right, that we're talking about. There is not a finite number of F&B consumer dollars, right, that are available, um, uh, and we have to share it now with delivery. I think delivery has expanded the revenue associated with consuming food and beverage. And we just have to find the right ways to integrate delivery, the delivery channel into it. It is not how we go dark with a portion of it. So uh, the, you know, um, I, I'm the worst guy to ask that question too, because I absolutely <laughs> believe that we are, we still just operate in a, in a, in a guest service environment where we <laughs> open doors and we smile at people and we say, thank you. And you just can't do that through the delivery channels. Thanks, Robert. Ben, mm. what are your thoughts on this? I know I had a question uh, set aside for you about given the rising popularity of ghost kitchens, what knock-on effect might this have for dine-in hotel restaurants? So 
perhaps you can answer that in relation to what Ben was asking earlier. Yeah, and I think I think a lot of a lot of what Robert Robert says sort of stands true. And I and I think from a pure chef's point of view, um, everything has to be coming off the pass, has to be double checked, the quality has to be there, the consistency, the standards. Um, but the I think it's an interesting part of the question because what goes on behind the bits that you can't see? I mean, it's very rare. Now, of course, there's some there's some beautiful boutique hotels and there's quite a few restaurants that probably do it, but the majority of restaurants don't make or bake their own bread. So that, that, that element is gone and we all go, oh, isn't it lovely bread? Isn't it great? They're not making their own butter. So that's been, so there are so many elements of what we do that are already bought in from outside. And as long as the process for doing that is about quality, consistency, and things that you can't really do yourself in that environment, whether that's a staffing challenge, an environment challenge. I mean, you go into some some hotels that look the most glamorous from the from the outside and from what the guest sees, and then the back of house team have a shoebox to, to kind of work in. And then they get asked to do 25 different starters, 50 different main courses, and, and make up your own desserts on the night. So everything needs to be a bit of a I mean I think I wrote down in my in my pre-notes kind of hybrid models for so many things yeah. technology shouldn't be everything but it needs to be part of what we do the data that Robert was talking about earlier and I love I love that element we, we used to when I was in hotels we used to want to know what the guest's favorite wine was but also what what things like what's the guest's favorite chocolate bar because if you love a Yorkie or you love a caramel and when you turn up someone gives you one of those it's the most cost-effective thing you can ever do that makes the guests go go wow. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I love those kind of bits when they come up. And I think if, if you put a brand on the, or a name on this restaurant, so you can pick any any chef you want. Maybe we'll, we'll go with Gordon Ramsay because someone like Robert's on the call. So there's a, there's a sort of UK-US connection. You've got to be really lucky to be in one of Gordon Ramsay's restaurants when Gordon Ramsay is there. I mean, you, you've got a kind of, you, you, you can play the lottery type thing. So everything associated with that name has to be, has to be what's delivered. And if it's not, then people have a right to say, well, well, hold on a minute. And we need to have that philosophy all the way through. If you say as a hotel and as a restaurant that you do it yourself, then you kind of need to be doing it yourself for the most part. If you say you work with great suppliers and those suppliers can also be doing things for you, Again, there's not many of us that make our own cheese. Uh, there's not many of us that, that cure all our own charcuterie and those kind of things. So we do it to an extent with certain products. Um, there has to be an element where, that, where that's balanced out because otherwise the, the intricacies and the knowledge and the skills of the chefs will be lost. And if you lose them, as we all know now, it's really, really to give, to, difficult to get them back. And what you lose when you take away all of the chef capacity and bring in total dark kitchens and total everything from outside is the customer that says you know what can i have that just without without something can i have that a tiny bit more spicy can i have that with a little yeah. bit less of something and that that i think in so many of our environments is where the real difference comes in where you can you can just not fancy it today or you've got or you've got an allergy or or something i think that's the bit where you lose you lose that creativity yeah. element you lose the opportunity to to really react to the guests that you have in front of you. And if you use the technologies that have been spoken about today, you you have the admin style process that I know also came up in one of Ben's questions. Um, I don't mind losing that to a point as long as the other data uh, element that Robert was talking about earlier is also brought in so that you can have a good conversation with them about where they're from, what they've done, the time they came before, where the beef comes from, what Mark's favorite dish is, all, all those kind of things. And if you, so I think it's a kind of hybrid all the way through, but you have, it goes back to being true to the brand. If you say we are a local, sustainable, everything's bought within 25 meters of the hotel, well, I don't know where you're getting your pepper from because it's not, it's not within 25 meters of most hotel as an, as an example, unless you're, unless you're close to the sea, you're not, you're not seasoning anything with salt either. So it's understanding the whole of that brand and being true to it. And if that means 25% dark kitchens, 50% dark kitchens, uh, everything on site, I think there's horses for courses. And, and it's very difficult to say this is what everyone should do because some hotels are running with 
four or five chefs and some have still got 60, 70. They're very lucky, mm. but they, some have still got them. To try and have one, one rule fits all is, is really, really tough. And mm. if we had another couple of hours, we could, we could explore a lot more, a lot more of those and, and go into a lot more nuances about it. But it's, a, it's the hybrid kind of um, flex what you need to do for your own model that would probably work. Mm -hmm. I think just 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 on that, and partly in answer to the uh, the question from from Ben, there was I think that the the managing of of, of admin and and you know taking out front of house stuff, I think absolutely on a case by case basis because you got you know some hotels where they'd absolutely want to mandate digital ordering. You've got other end of the spectrum where you would absolutely want face to face. You've got others in between who would want a, a, a bit of both. Um, but I think, you know, that's the, that's the beauty of the front of house staff, you know, that's their hospitality skill where they can read people. Um, they're in the business because they are people, you know, in the people industry. So you can tell the person who sits down on his own with a newspaper might not want to be interrupted, placing, you know, very tech savvy and can place everything himself compared to, I know, a couple that's coming in for a nice romantic meal and want to be wined and dined and, and, you know, talk to with uh, with with a great smile. So, um, I think the technology needs to needs to support all you know both of the, all of the all of those scenarios. Thanks, Dom. And we have slightly overrun on our webinar, though I do think it was a conversation that we needed to have. But I'm just got a few. Um, I've got a few outro slides that I need to run through before we fully close off today. I want to highlight the next webinar in the Trailblazer series. It's happening on Monday, September the 27th at the same time, two o'clock BST. It's called Reshaping the Owner Operator Relationship. And the link to that webinar has been posted in the chat. We would love to see you there. We are now only six weeks away from the Urban Living Festival. This is um, an event that we're holding on the 26th and 27th of October at Tobacco Dock in London. And this event is really in response to how uh, hospitality and real estate is starting to blur. And as such, this event is built around three stages called Stay, Live and work and if you would like to hear more about the Urban Living Festival and the other webinars in the Trailblazer series I encourage you to get in touch with my colleague Katie. Her details have just come up on your screen now, um, you've got her uh, email address and number there and I believe they're also being popped into the chat and we would love to hear from you. And that is a wrap. Thanks so much to our trailblazers for the insightful conversation. Uh, thanks to our sponsors, Bizon and Aperto. And thank you to the audience for tuning in and asking those questions. Um, we'll see you in a few weeks, a couple of weeks time, sorry. And what we're going to do is leave the session open for an extra two minutes in case anybody wants to uh, follow up on all the links, but by no means uh, feel free to stay, particularly our trailblazers if you need to hop off somewhere. But just letting you know that we're leaving the session open for an extra couple minutes here. But do take care and hopefully see you all next week. <laughs>